Oh, brothers and sisters, I am so grateful to be here tonight and I am so excited because I love young women. And ladies, I remember what it was like to be a young woman. I was so excited to leave primary and I thought if I had to sing one more song, do one more sharing time or participate in one more primary program, I was going to die of embarrassment. But while I was excited to grow up, turn 12, and become a beehive, I was so nervous. My mom was a school teacher, and so I pack up every morning and go to school with her, and not the school that was in my neighborhood boundaries and where all the kids in my ward and neighborhood went. So I didn't know these girls super well, but whether I liked it or not, I was going to be a beehive. And so the very first activity ever for me and young women's was doing baptisms for the dead at the temple. And I remember being so nervous, but I went through, I got all the right clothes that I was supposed to grab, and I was sitting there in the chapel waiting for the rest of the young men and young women in my ward to come when this girl named Amy, who was a my maid at the time, came and sat next to me. And she kind of gave me this weird side-eyed glance, and she was like, ugh. Obviously, you don't know the secret. And I froze. I mean, it's my first time in the temple, right? And I'm nervous. I'm 12 years old. And there's some sort of secret that I'm supposed to know. And I wear my heart on my sleeve. And so she could see that I was starting to really panic and wonder what was wrong that I wasn't doing that everybody else was. And so finally, a little perturbed, she said, Ugh, let me help you. And she grabbed, I had pinned my little keys to the side of my jumpsuit. And she took that and she she pinned it under my zipper. And she said, there, there you go. Now, when they dunk you in the font, you won't stand up and the zipper won't come down and you won't be standing there naked. <laughs> and if I could have died of embarrassment, I, I would have. And I remember the distinct thought of young women's is going to eat me alive. But I did learn to love young women's and I grew to really love the girls that I was with and I felt loved by my leaders and it made all the difference in the world. And I learned some really important things in young women's like I learned about the power of prayer when I was a Maya maid and I was in Sunday school one time and I swear there is an unspoken commandment that when you are in Sunday school it's segregated. Boys sit on one side, girls sit on the other and you don't talk to each other and you don't ever raise your hand when a teacher asks a question because it's not the cool thing to do. And that's exactly what was happening one day in Sunday school. And to make it worse, we had a substitute. And our poor sub was trying everything that he could, could to get us to participate and to, you know, actively be involved in his lesson and we weren't having it. And so finally he asked, guys, when is a time that you felt Heavenly Father answered your prayers? And he just sat there and waited and waited and waited for somebody to answer. And I remember looking at my feet thinking, oh, I don't want to answer again because I'm going to be the class know-it-all, right? But thankfully, this girl named Bailey raised her hand and she said, yeah, I've got an experience I'd like to share. And we were all really excited because Bailey wasn't really one to participate all the time. And she said, well, last weekend when I was at my cage fighting match. Now, I would like to pause here and explain that up until this point in my life, I had no idea that cage fighting was a recreational activity. So to continue the story, Bailey said, so last week at my cage fighting match, I learned about the power of prayer. And there was this girl that I knew from school and we were really egging each other on and all of our friends were getting into it because we knew that we were going to fight later on. And so when I got into the cage with this girl, I really wanted to, to win this match. And she said that as they started to box fight, I don't, I don't know exactly what you call it when you're cage fighting, but as they started to go at it, Bailey realized that she was in trouble. That this girl was strong, that this girl um, had a great technique, and she was getting really hurt. And so she remembers that they stopped, took a little break for a second, and when she was in her corner, she said that she got, she folded her arms and she said a prayer. And she said, Heavenly Father, please help me knock this girl out in one punch. <laughs> and 
she said amen and turned back around. The fight started again and she pulled back her fist with all of her might and she punched this girl so hard that she knocked her out. <laughs> and I will never forget sitting there in class as Bailey said, and so I knew Heavenly Father answered my prayers. And I, I just remember that. And I, I'll remember it till the day I die because our poor substitute looked at her. And we're all baffled. My, my mouth is on the floor. And he said, you know what, Bailey? I am sure that was an answer to your prayers. And there's just so many fun things to learn in young women's, let alone the crazy experiences that you share together. But I remember being 17 and I was a laurel and I had my first kiss. But of course, I didn't tell anybody that that was my first kiss because I was really embarrassed that it didn't happen at 16 when I was kiss eligible, right? And I don't know, I thought it was a great kiss, but apparently it wasn't because I was kissed on a Friday night and I went home and I kept waiting for him to text me back. And he didn't text me back on Friday or Saturday or Sunday. And Monday at school, he avoided me. And I remember it was when I was a Laurel that I experienced my first heartbreak. And around that time in my life, I was working for my dad, who owns an online retail company. And he sells men's fashion accessories like cufflinks, tie bars, money clips, and all of their stuff like that. But it was... But most of it is branded with sports teams or the latest movies like Harry Potter or Disney. And so I always had the coolest teenage job. And every year we would work a booth in Salt Lake City at Comic-Con selling our superhero gear. Now, I always loved working at Comic-Con because one, it was a break from like the average just filling shipping orders but also because you would see the most amazing and elaborate costumes you've ever seen in your life. And I do have to admit though that when adults here they can dress up, there's two schools of thought. One, they have amazing costumes to make up for every Halloween that went wrong in their childhood. Or they think, how little clothing can I wear and still be considered a costume? So, you know, you always got some different costumes. And People would come up to me and they would ask, you know, who was my favorite superhero, right? And honestly, I had no idea. And so it really got me thinking at that stage of my life, who was my hero? And who did I look up to? Ladies, I want to ask you that same question. Who is your hero? Now, throughout our lives, we're going to have lots of different heroes and we're going to have different types of heroes. But I wanted to talk to you today about two heroes that are the heroes that always have your back. And the first is the Holy Ghost. When I was in elementary school, we had these elderly ladies we called ground duties. And they would walk around at recess and make sure all of us kids weren't breaking any rules. And for all I was concerned, they were there to make sure we didn't have any fun. And sadly, I used to view the Holy Ghost as a spiritual ground duty. His job was to tell me what I could and couldn't do, and it would sometimes bug me. I still, to this day, my best friend in the whole world is not a member of the church. And when we were in elementary school, this really didn't matter at all. But as we grew older, the church kind of became a wedge between our friendship. And not because of us, but because of other people. Bree's group of friends and my group of friends were two drastically different people. And her group of friends would say things about me like I was a goody-goody and I just cared about converting them and I was a wet blanket. My group of friends were all good Latter-day Saint young women, right? Um, and they didn't make Bree feel very welcome because she wasn't churchy. She didn't have the same standards and it was very obvious. So... We decided that Tuesday was our day and we would just play just the two of us on Tuesday and nothing mattered on Tuesday except for our love for each other and our friendship. So one Monday, I remember Brie came up to me and she said that she couldn't hang out on Tuesday. And I was so disappointed. I mean, that was our day. And I asked her why and she kind of like was beating around the bush. But finally she said, well, I'm going to a movie with my friends and if, if you want, you can come. We're going to go see Sweeney Todd. 
and my heart dropped because yeah, I wanted to go to a movie with Brie. Like that sounded like a blast, but I knew that Sweeney Todd was rated R. And so I told her, I said, Brie, I'm really sorry, but I can't go to that. So I guess I'll have to hang out with you next week. And I remember walking into my house and going down to my room and crying. I was devastated and I was mad. And I wasn't mad at my parents because I knew that if I begged them long enough and pleaded and bartered, they would probably let me go. And I wasn't mad at Brie for inviting me because, you know what, a movie's rating didn't matter to her at all. I was mad at the Holy Ghost because once again, he was being a spiritual ground duty to take away my fun and to distance myself from my best friend. And all because I wanted to follow the prophet's counsel to not see rated R movies. And it was the Holy Ghost that had touched my heart and told me, Abby, you know you can't see that movie. Well, it wasn't until I was a Laurel that this attitude changed for me. <laughs> Do you remember that boy that I kissed and then he never texted me back? Well, for reasons I still don't quite understand, maybe teenage hormones, we dated on and off my whole junior year. And finally, the summer of my senior year, he broke up with me and he told me he wanted nothing to do with me ever again. Now, beehives and my mates, I want you to take note about this. When a boy breaks up with you, there are a couple stages of emotions you go through. First, denial, then sadness, then anger, and then you go through this crazy stage where you aren't thinking very rationally. <laughs> that is the stage I was in when I decided I wanted to do something so unlike myself because apparently who I was wasn't good enough for this boy. So I grabbed a friend and we went to an explore an abandoned church. Sounds like a great idea, right? Well, I'm not too rebellious. I even asked my mom for permission and she thought it was a great idea because my grandpa used to be the bishop of this church. But nevertheless, we went to this old abandoned church where all the windows were um, boarded up with boards and said, do not enter trespassing. And we decided to find a loose board and we crawled inside and explored. Still to this day, I don't know exactly what I was thinking. I blame it on this breakup, crazy stage of emotion. But the whole time I was there, I had this incredibly uneasy feeling. I just felt like I shouldn't be there. I felt like this wasn't okay, even though, yeah, I had my mom's permission. And yes, my parents knew where I was. And no, we weren't trying to do anything crazy, but I had this sticky awful feeling that wouldn't leave me alone. Well, <laughs> I bet you guessed it. We got caught by the cops. These red and blue lights showed up outside. And before I knew it, I was standing by the door where we had got in, praying, hoping that these cops would leave before they caught us. And I remember just praying and saying, Heavenly Father, please help me. You know, I didn't mean to do anything serious. Like, this was just innocent fun. And I remember the Holy Ghost saying to me, Abby, I love you, but I can't take away this natural consequence. But I won't leave you by yourself. And that is when it clicked for me. That the Holy Ghost wasn't a spiritual ground duty. He was my best friend. He was somebody who always had my back and somebody who cared about my general well-being. And because of that, he wasn't going to leave my side even when I made a stupid mistake. That was one of the first times that I can remember thinking, wow, the Holy Ghost is just trying to save me from pain and trouble. And my view on his role in my life changed. He's our friend. He only wants what's best for us and will always, always take care of us. The scriptures say that the Holy Ghost will bring all things to our remembrance and that he will testify of Christ and can dwell inside of us. I can't think of someone sounding more like a hero than the Holy Ghost who protects, guides, and strengthens us. I love the Holy Ghost. He is not a spiritual ground duty. He's our friend and our hero, especially when we are trying to be led back on the path to find and live with our Heavenly Father. 
President Spencer W. Kimball said that the Holy Ghost comes to you as you grow and learn and make yourself worthy. Sherry Dew has said that, and I love this the most, that no amount of time in front of the mirror will make you as attractive as having the Holy Ghost with you. Do you view the Holy Ghost as a spiritual ground duty or as your hero? Do you try to listen to his guidance? It becomes so much easier to do so when we understand and appreciate him as our hero. Now, the last hero I want to talk about tonight is our Savior Jesus Christ. Nephi of old wrote, We talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, and we write according to our prophecies that our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. Hopefully all of us in the church know that Christ is our hero because we do just as Nephi instructed us to do. Sometimes, though, I think we view Christ as an abstract being. I remember sitting through lesson after lesson about Jesus Christ and learning about why he's our hero, his atonement, the resurrection, making eternal life with Heavenly Father possible. Our depth of gratitude and respect we owe towards Christ can feel so overwhelming that sometimes I fear we bundle all of those things together and simply say, thank you, Jesus. I know I did this. And when I was in seventh grade, I, oh man, I was a crazy spunky redhead and I was competitive. And we were playing just a regular football game in gym. And because I was so competitive, I leaped in the air. I grabbed the football and in the process, I accidentally tackled a girl and rolled into the bleachers and I dislocated and broke my finger. And it was the first time I'd ever broken a bone and I played the piano at the time. I played the violin at the time and it was a very traumatic experience for me. And sadly, I I never got that bone healed correctly, despite going to different doctors, despite having it re-broken by an orthopedic surgeon, my bone never healed straight. And so in my family, it's this joke that I have a witchy finger because the tip of it definitely is crooked. And I remember being in seventh grade and being devastated that I would never have one of those beautiful pictures of when you get engaged or married and you they hold out the bride's hand with the ring on it. I never took one of those because my finger is crooked. And I remember sitting in class and we were learning about the resurrection and we were learning about how not a hair on our body will be lost and that we'll be in a perfect form in a state. And I was thinking, yeah, 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 I know this. Young forever, no hair lost like that. Sounds awesome. And then I looked down at my hand and I looked at my finger And for the first time ever, I realized that my body was broken and that I had an imperfection, something I thought about all the time, something I was embarrassed about, something that I wanted to hide. And if I could, I would fix it because no surgeon could fix it. I realized that the resurrection was real to me. And I, it was something that I was looking forward to, that my Savior could take away that little thing of straining my finger and making me feel more confident in my hands. And it became real for me. When we personalize our relationship with the Savior, that's when our lives change. My testimony was really formed at the hand of my grandmother. I would go over there every single Sunday. I We lived in the same ward. I could ride my bike over to her house. And we would sit and talk about life, about boys, about my brothers. And we just had the best time. And I remember that my grandma would say to me all the time, Abby, Jesus Christ loves you and he knows you. And she would tell me that he knows so much more than your name that sometimes when people stand up and say you know I know Jesus Christ knows my name my grandma would would 
would shudder a little bit and say, you know what? He knows so much more about you that it's insulting to think that he just knows your name and nothing else. And I remember another Sunday she said the same thing to me that Jesus Christ knows me, knows so much more than just my name. And I went home and I don't know, it didn't sit right with me. And I just thought to myself, really, really, Jesus Christ knows me because I've got eight classes, a job, homework, a broken heart, a disadvantaged friend, and so many other problems that I can't keep track. How could Jesus Christ know all of that? And even if he does because he's a God, why would he care? I want you to know that Jesus Christ does care. And he knows everything everything about you. Why? (laughs) Why you ask like I did when I was 17? Because he loves you. If he didn't, he wouldn't have bled from every pore, hung on a cross, and died for you. My favorite scripture is 1 Nephi 21 verses 14 through 16, and I'm going to summarize it here. But it says, Zion has said that the Lord has forsaken us. So that, I think that's how we feel all the time, right? The Lord doesn't know me. Jesus Christ doesn't know who I am and my struggles. But if we look at Nephi, he says, But behold, he will show that he hath not. For can a woman forget her sucking child that she will not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, she may forget. Yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have engraven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. I think so often of our Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he wanted to quit. The pain was so excruciating, so much more than he thought, that he said, Father, if there is any way, let this cup pass. He's asking, if there's any way, can I not do this? Is there maybe another way that man and everybody can be saved that I don't have to suffer like this? But there wasn't. And he didn't shrink away from that cup. And he completed his mission because he loves you. And with that much invested in you before you were even born... There should be no doubt in your mind that Christ would care about every single aspect of your life. When we understand this, that the love of Christ is real, that it's ever present and it is for you, then we come to understand that Christ is the hero of our lives. He is the living son of the living God and he is not an abstract being that knows only your name, how you're doing in church, and if you were good last Saturday night. He, his love will encircle you if you will simply take one step, if you will only turn in his direction. Jeffrey R. Holland said, may we follow Christ with every ounce of your being in good times and in bad. I pray to do the same. And I wish that for you as well, because it isn't easy being a young woman. But when you know recognize and rely upon your heroes, life becomes easier to bear. Burdens are lightened and your path, which right now is an open road full of so many possibilities, is revealed to you step by step. I want to leave you my testimony that I know Jesus Christ lives. I know God is real. I know that he loves you. And I know that if you rely upon the Holy Ghost and Jesus Christ, you will experience joy and happiness despite the hardships of youth, despite some of the challenges that will come to you as a young woman. I leave you this testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.